The United Nations Security Council has extended the mandate of its peacekeeping mission in southern Lebanon by another year. But the resolution saw some fierce debate on how the force would function with the Lebanese representatives to the United Nations raising some serious concerns. Why did Lebanon have reservations about the extension of the UNIFIL mission? The SAG-AFTRA union, which represents hundreds of thousands of actors and other performers in the United States and is currently on strike against the major film studios, is now asking members to vote on a strike action against the video game industry. What has forced the union to open up a potential second front? This is Daily Debrief coming to you, as always, from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Dhani. Our top story, UNIFIL, the United Nations peacekeeping mission in Lebanon, a, a multilateral force that has proved a stabilizing influence in the region since the mission began back in 1978, finds its mandate extended by a year. This came after a vote in the United, uh, United Nations Security Council that Russia and China, both of course who are uh, permanent members, abstained from the vote on the grounds that the concerns raised by the Lebanese government had not been addressed in the resolution proposed by France. Despite the objections, of course, none of the permanent members vetoed the resolution and it stands adopted. Dr. Abdul Rahman covers the region for People's Dispatch. Let's go over, over to him now. Abdul, good to have you with us on the show. Uh, uh, the eventual decision to extend the mandate of UNIFIL, the, the UN's uh, peacekeeping mission, uh, not at all a unanimous matter. Uh, Lebanon raised some concerns and uh, stating those or stating that they have not been accurately addressed, uh, Russia and China abstained from the vote. Tell us how it went down and, and what are the consequences of this extension? Well, uh, this extension, uh, of course, as you rightly pointed out, is not unanimous. Uh, ideally, most of the, though all the countries agreed that there is a need for a peacekeeping mission in Lebanon and uh, uh, these international forces have contributed immensely in kind of keeping peace in the region, but uh, the way it is extended uh, was not acceptable to most of the countries. No, sorry, not most, at least some of the countries in the uh, in the United Nations Security Council, primarily the Russia and China. Since you had, uh, so Lebanon does not have the vote, of course, uh, it did not uh, reflect it. Uh, it was not reflected in the proceedings, but uh, its representative was there. Uh, while the voting was going on and before the voting, it is specifically mentioned that the provision which basically was inserted uh, in the draft resolution which was prepared by France uh, uh, on the insisted, uh, insistence on, of, the, uh, of the United States, uh, yeah. which says that the UN peacekeeping mission can patrol the reasons, particularly the Southern uh, Lebanon region, uh, without informing uh, the military, Lebanese military, without informing the authorities, uh, without coordinating, it, it Im implies that without coordinating with them. And that basically leads to a violation of Lebanese sovereignty. Because Lebanon has a full-fledged government, of course, uh, because of the disputes over the border between Israel and uh, uh, Lebanon, Lebanon, this peacekeeping mission was necessitated. But it does not mean that there is a no there is no government in Lebanon. Right. So whatever it is doing, it has to basically coordinate its movements with the Lebanese uh, army, with the Lebanese government. But the resolution is specifically mentioned, and as I said before, on the insistence of the United States that uh, 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 it should be allowed to move independently without... Freedom the, of movement. What they yeah, are exactly. Without the consent of the Lebanese government. So, of course, it was objected by the Lebanese representative. And this was uh, basically supported by the Chinese and the Russian uh, representatives in the uh, in the Security Council meeting, uh, and that's why they abstained uh, during the uh, vote. Mm -hmm. um, this has basically a larger opposition within Lebanon, despite mm -hmm. the fact that we see that in media reports which came out uh, uh, following uh, the resolution was adopted uh, and the UNIFIL's uh, mandate was extended for one more year. Uh, Nazib Mikati, the caretaker prime minister in Lebanon agreeing with the resolution saying that oh it addresses some of the concerns raised by Lebanon but that is not the official version despite the fact that this is the 
Prime Minister is speaking in, on the forum of the United Nations Security Council. The official Lebanese position is this particular provision violates the sovereignty of Lebanon. Of so Lebanon. Uh, that is what uh, is the technical uh, issue uh, with the UNIFIL's extension at this time. Uh, you can uh, touch on maybe, uh, Abdul, if you want a uh, little bit on how this kind of also reflects the gaps that exist in the functioning of the Security Council itself. Because uh, like you're pointing out, Lebanon is a country. It has, there is a government in place. There's a military in place. And, uh, and if, if an outside force or even, a, even a, if it's a multinational peacekeeping force uh, needs to have sort of uh, keep that sovereignty in mind. Uh, but but there was also mention of the specificities of the conditions on the ground not being considered. Uh, so what are uh, the opposition, the reasons for the opposition to this force, and particularly this aspect of freedom of movement? That that, that well, that, there are two different parts of uh, your question. One, uh, yeah. of course, is related to the ground, uh, the uh, the realities on the ground because of which Lebanon particularly has officially taken a stand against this provision. By the way, this provision is not for the first time introduced. It was introduced last year uh, when the extension was uh, given for this, uh, which expired on uh, on uh, August 31st. For this, it was uh, for the first time introduced primarily on the insistence of, it is said that the US and Israeli, uh, Israel. And this is, if you see that there is already a very intense situation on the border in Southern Lebanon and Hezbollah, one of the resistance groups, which was very instrumental, very, important, which played a very important role in pushing the Israelis forces which occupied uh, southern Lebanon for decades mm. uh, to go uh, kind of uh, to liberate that space had is uh, still operating and they in that area uh, provides assistance to attempted uh, uh, occupation of Israel. And it says that if uh, uh, UNIFIL uh, uh, is allowed to move freely, it mostly is expected to act as an spy for the Israeli uh, occupation because there has been instances in the past where Hezbollah's resistance have been coordinated with the uh, Lebanese, uh, sorry, Israeli forces and that basically Hezbollah has objected to. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, that that becomes the part of the uh, reason which we, because of which uh, uh, both uh, the Hezbollah and the officially Lebanon and other countries have objected to this. Uh, as far as the larger uh, issue of United Nations Security Council's working is concerned, of course, if you see just a few days back, there was an exchange, uh, there was a debate related to Mali. Mm. And similar instance, uh, similar uh, issues were raised. Mali was saying that they do not want the extension of uh, uh, the UN uh, peacekeeping. Mission. Of course, that is withdrawn, but they mm. do not want uh, the sanctions, the United mm. Nations the Security Council right. sanctions to continue. Mm. But despite uh, a Malian objection, uh, there were majority of the Security Council members who, who were ready to extend it. Thankfully, Russia vetoed it vetoed and it, yeah. basically respecting the Malian uh, wish. But if you see majority of the countries, particularly uh, uh, the, the West, what we call West, the United States and its allies in Europe, those who are security council, permanent members of the Security Council, they basically are unanimous when it comes to kind of imposing a particular kind of agenda. And the voices from the third world, from the developing countries, from Africa and uh, Latin America and other uh, parts of the world are mostly neglected. Their concerns are not uh, uh, taken into consideration, despite the fact that this is a UN body, which is mm. based on a charter, which says that the, it is made of the sovereign uh, independent states and their wish uh, is primary, their wish their consent is primary when it is uh, on making and deciding on its policies. Uh, but most of the time, it, when it comes to the weaker countries, relatively economically weaker countries, the third world countries and others, the West try to impose its policies on it. And so what happened in Lebanon, given the, uh, the largest geopolitical calculations between Israel and US in the region and France also, basically uh, their wish gets imposed and the, the concerns raised by uh, Lebanon is ignored as it were, it, there was an attempt to do the same in, in the case of the Mali. And there are several other instances. Instances. Uh, yeah, uh, not, not just their wishes, uh, Abdul, of course, it's because the West knows best. Uh, yeah, and, and just, just finally, we've seen a wave in, uh, you were mentioning uh, Africa as well. Uh, in in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've seen a series of uh, regime changes uh, there. 
uh, and uh, anti-French uh, sort of sentiment uh, playing a part in that process. Uh, do you see any of that connecting in any way to Lebanon? Uh, not in that way, of course, because Lebanon itself is there is a political uh, turmoil going on in the country for uh, more than a year now. Uh, if, if you want to expand it further, it, you can say more than five six years now. Yes. And 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 that because of the turmoil, there is no uh, uh, government in Lebanon as such, and uh, there is no uh, apart from the Hezbollah, which is also uh, unlike in Africa where the progressive forces are not represented mostly in the uh, electoral politics or in the country's parliament. Mm. In Lebanon, that is not the case. Hezbollah right. still has a strong presence in Lebanese parliament. And mm. there are talks going on for last one year to kind of form a government. So that the kind of political equation, which basically brings the army into the power, which yeah. was there in Africa, is not the case in Lebanon. Lebanon. So of course, uh, that part is not there. But the larger uh, argument related to the attempts by the colonial countries, uh, for example, and in both the cases, it is France. Lebanon yeah. was a colony kind of mandate of France as yeah. the most of the West African countries. So yeah. that the treatment, uh, the behavior of France remains the same, despite the fact that uh, there are de uh, domestic uh, variations, differences. Uh, differences. All right. Thanks very much for that, Abdul. And our second bit today, the SAG after union announced on Friday that it is seeking authorization from its members to begin a second strike. This time, the aim is at the video game industry. After negotiations on a new video game contract reached a stalemate, union leadership has been pushed to seek for strike action approvals as bargaining tools in the struggle to win wage increases and protections from artificial intelligence. In a state statement, sag president, Fran Drescher, blasted the video game companies for their greed and disrespect. The terms of both the wage negotiations are pretty similar, even if the specificities are slightly different. Anish joins us now for more on both the similarities as well as the differences and why the union's hand has been forced. Uh, Anish, uh, so sag after they're clearly looking to uh, kind of open up a second front with the lack of movement uh, on negotiations, uh, both for, of course, wage increases uh, as well as other conditions. Uh, t tell us what is uh, sort of happening in, in regard to the fight with the video game industry. Uh, of course, it's all, it's all connected uh, more and more these days with the digitization of, of both mediums or all the mediums. Uh, so yeah, what's happening with, with the video game studios uh, and the unions and why are the uh, union members being asked to vote now for the right to uh, threaten uh, industrial action? Well, uh, let's, let's begin with the fact that the current contract that they are working on, uh, that sag and the video games uh, producers are working on, uh, is already expired. Uh, they are working on an extension. Uh, the contract actually, previous contract expired in November last year. And so there is a one year extension that is happening and that's pretty much what is in effect right now. And the extension was uh, only put in place primarily because uh, uh, the union uh, expected uh, good faith uh, negotiations with the producers, uh, but that hasn't happened. There has been like what the what the statement that we see uh, right now is pretty much showing that there is a stalemate, and stalemate is a very mild term considering that it has been months of negotiations. Uh, and uh, the next round will be happening in September. And it's pretty much on the same day that they will be having a vote on the strike. So it's pretty much, uh, they have been pushed to this decision. And uh, we must begin with that, unlike a previous set of, uh, like the other, uh, like the actor strike and the, uh, the writer strike that has been, that is happening in tandem uh, mm -hmm. against uh, the film producers. This is uh, a more or less expected outcome because there has been uh, a, a significant delay in actually getting a resolution and not just resolution but also the fact that uh, previous conditions like uh, were also not very uh, great to begin with uh, we are looking at uh, act, uh, performers and artists who suffered a lot uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and let's begin and this is also pretty much points out the fact that since it's a video games industry you won't have you won't be having a listers uh, being the you know the face of the strike as the media would like to portray. These are pretty much your average uh, 
uh, you know, contract workers uh, who pretty much make uh, more or less the, uh, you know, the average uh, daily wage workers, like the salaries of most daily wage workers uh, in the, yeah, sorry, hourly wage workers in the United States and California. So this, uh, and many, as a, a, uh, many of them pretty much have suffered a lot, like pretty much because of like real time uh, wage decline and, you know, stagnation. And that is something that has affected uh, pretty much artists of all kinds. Uh, this includes stunt, act, uh, stunt artists uh, who are pretty much at the center of the discussion here. Uh, safety procedures uh, in studios, uh, the fact that there is the working conditions have not really uh, developed or progressed from the previous strike that actually happened in 2016. Mm. So this is uh, something that uh, brings out a whole lot of other issues that obviously the sag uh, writer writers strike uh, brought up. Uh, in addition to the kind of uh, issues that they brought up, the other strike, the Hollywood strike brought up. So this kind of uh, also highlights a significant section of you know uh, job opportunities for the same set of artists uh who are affected in a very different way by a very different industry not a very different industry it's quite connected but uh in the terms of you know technical uh and professional uh skills that are required to be in that industry it's different uh in many ways right. uh, already i i would assume uh anish a lot of these uh, game studios a are based around the world uh, and B, also then uh, position their jobs or ship their jobs out around the world. So uh, perhaps uh, that becomes a negative uh, point on the bargaining table. Uh, but explain to us some of the differences and commonalities that you see uh, between what actors as well as other performers uh, and, of course, writers uh, are facing uh, when it comes to the Hollywood strike and when it comes to the video game industry. Well, uh, the... Similarities would be the fact that it's pretty much the same set of demands, primarily because it's the same kind of crisis that they're facing. Yeah. We are looking at uh, real wages uh, coming down because of the recent cost of living crisis that has affected everybody. Uh, and it's not just these performers and artists, but uh, pretty much everybody across the sector and around the world, actually. Mm. So this is nothing new. Uh, and this is something that we're seeing in different strikes and industrial actions and multiple negotiations that are happening in the U.S. and around the world as well. So it's the same sort of demands that are coming up primarily because they want to reinforce uh, whatever gains they made in the previous strike. In the previous right. strike that actually went on for 11 months uh, in 2016 uh, against the video games uh, industry, uh, pretty much brought out a significant level of gains, especially, uh, you know, workplace safety uh, uh, and wages. And uh, much of that has been undone primarily because of the, the economic fallouts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is what the, uh, the new strike, if it happens and if it gets uh, passed by the union, uh, will be addressing as well. But on top of that, you also have additional uh, issues of, uh, you know, like because video games industry would be the first to actually has is the first to be impacted by the uh, by the advent of AI and mm. the manner in which AI is being, uh, you know, used by the video games producers industry uh, is something that uh, more or less uh, does this work of replacing actors. And it's not even about job outsourcing at this point. It's pretty much just completely vanishing jobs that are necessary. Uh, and there is no, uh, um, uh, you know, attempt by the producers to actually uh, make replacements or, you know, make sure that workers are not affected. There's also mm -hmm. the work of, like, and matters of uh, work safety, sorry, workplace safety that is, uh, kind of different from you know your average film studios because yeah. you're looking at much of you know what we understand from uh, you know major game developers they pretty much depend on stunt performers who are you know and actors and performers uh, who pretty much give the you know the motion uh, image and everything uh, the techno the technology is pretty much based on actual humans uh, you know performing these things in, those in a studio. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, the fact that they are undermined and, you know, uh, overlooked in the current scenario pretty much shows uh, a real crisis in, in itself. And the kind of like fact that there is no 
uh, you know, on-site medic, which is something that actually exists in, uh, you know, in film studios, uh, uh, shows that there is, a, uh, it's just a tip of the iceberg of how uh, workplace safety is not that big of a priority for the industry, at least uh, industry's uh, owners, and that creates a problem with the workers. You also have the same set of demands uh, when it comes to uh, protections, uh, with wage increases, uh, there is a 10 percent, uh, there's a demand for 10 percent, 11 percent uh, retroactive uh, wage hike that sh that would account for the the real wage, wage decline loss. in mm. wage laws that happened during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. Uh, but uh, and also a four plus four uh, percentage annual uh, wage increase in the next over the next two years, something that is necessary for them to actually make a decent living as well for most of yeah, them. Keep the uh, because they, water. They, exactly. And also, uh, you know, the minimum staffing, so something that does not really exist in most uh, TV, uh, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. video game studios, mm -hmm. uh, is also something that uh, impacts these workers and artists. And they pretty much, have, you know, uh, have depend a large part of that uh, through these uh, jobs as well uh, to sustain mm -hmm. themselves when they're not, uh, you know, in film studios working. So this is something that will be highlighted um, uh, in the current set of negotiations. The fact that producers are not really, uh, you know, taking these factors into account is something that is, uh, you know, a matter of concern for the union. And that is something uh, we'll see. That is the reason why there's a need or necessity for a second front to open up in the video games industry for the strike to actually make an impact on, uh, you know, about 120,000 workers yeah. we are looking. We are not talking about A-listers. We're talking yeah. about average workers who pretty much sustain much of the work uh, of the industry, of, the of industry. both industries. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Anish. Appreciate you continuing to track uh, the sag after strike for us. That's a wrap for this episode of Daily Debrief and also brings to an end our week's coverage of the news and other events on People's Dispatch. Uh, for more such stories, we invite you to head to our website, as always, peoplesdispatch.org. Don't also forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back same time, same place next week. Until then, stay safe. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.